now it's 2013, almost 2014, which is kind of crazy. Where are we now? So there is a new wave of thought that nutrients that may not be considered essential or even underappreciated may be important for fighting aging or age-related conditions. And these nutrients now are classified as longevity vitamins. So unlike an essential vitamin, a lack of longevity vitamins in the diet won't manifest in a disease per se, not like scurvy or goiter. Instead, a lack of these nutrients reduces the ability of the human body to function well over a course of a lifespan. So in other words, if you don't get enough of longevity vitamins in your diet, you won't immediately notice or feel an effect. But over a longer period of time, the body won't function as well as it could. And so ergothionine is a prime example of a longevity vitamin proposed for healthy aging. So here are some examples of research study headlines conducted by esteemed professors globally to support all the health benefits of ergothionine for healthy aging. From cognitive health to immune, cardiovascular, physical health, skin health, and more. And so in fact, the numbers of scientific papers that mention ergothionine has greatly increased this past decade. Ergothionine was discovered in 1909, and since its discovery, the interest has been low and steady. But in the past decade, the research has really taken off. And so let's talk about what is ergothionine. It's an amino acid originally isolated from a fungus found on rye, known as ergot. And so here is the chemical structure. It looks a lot like the amino acid histidine. And at physiological pH, ergothionine exists as a thione. So you got ergot, you got thione, ergothionine, so hence the name. So it has very interesting antioxidant properties. It has high redox potential. It's resistant to auto oxidation, like, unlike other thiols like glutathione. It acts as a metal chelator and it serves as a cellular protectant. And what's really interesting about ergothionine is that the cells in the human body expresses a very unique transporter for ergothionine, which allows ergothionine to get inside cells to combat oxidative stress. And so it's really interesting because ergothionine is not made in the human body. It's only found in the diet. And yet our bodies have designed a specific cellular transporter to allow ergothionine to get in for an, a molecule that the body doesn't even make. So this discovery was found in 2005, and that's what spurned the, the tremendous boom in scientific research papers, because researchers wanted to understand what is it about this molecule? Why, does the why do we even express this transporter uh, for a molecule that the body doesn't even make? So the transporter is expressed on many cell types in the human body from brain, eyes, heart, lungs, at least 290 different cell types in the human body expresses the ergothionine transporter. And the reason why I'm telling you this is for two major reasons. Why is this important for us to know? One, it means ergothionine is able to act on different cells of the human body. And so it's able to act multifunctionally across the human body in different organs, and that demonstrates the multifunctional potential and effect of ergothionine. Consumers are looking for multifunctional ingredients. We're not claiming that ergothionine is some magic bullet for aging, anti-aging, or health span, but the human body does express the ergothionine transporter across the body in many cell types. Number two, ergothionine is highly bioavailable due to the ergothionine transporter expressed everywhere. So in a, a, a human study, ergothionine is shown to be rapidly absorbed. It's retained in the human body, it's retained in cells, and there's very little that's excreted in the urine. And ergothionine is metabolized, but rather slowly. So out of the many health areas that I briefly introduced a couple of slides ago, 
much attention has been focused on ergothionine for cognitive health. The transporter is found in the brain, and it's also shown that ergothionine can cross the blood-brain barrier. So here is a study that measured blood ergothionine levels in 25 subjects with mild cognitive impairment, compared to 25 subjects that are age-matched, that are considered cognitively normal. And so it's found that ergothionine levels was much lower, significantly lower, in patients that had mild cognitive impairment. And the same trend was also seen in patients with Parkinson's disease compared to cognitively normal subjects. And so these subjects, these results among others, results suggest that a certain level of ergothionine in the blood is important, may be important for supporting brain health. And so what are some means to boost ergothionine levels in the blood? So here are some top foods enriched in ergothionine. And you can see the top sources are mushrooms, uh, with oyster mushrooms leading the way. And not shown on this graph are also porcini mushrooms are very enriched in ergothionine, followed by shiitake mushrooms, portobello mushrooms, button mushrooms. Tempeh also made it to the list, even though it's not a mushroom and garlic is another source of ergothionine. And so three ounce servings of mushroom sources and tempeh can provide between one milligram to seven milligrams of ergothionine. So that's another reason why to love mushrooms, right? I'm a, I, I love mushrooms myself and I, I love seeing all the mushroom innovations coming out in the market recently. And so mushrooms are gaining the popularity of consumers today, and mushroom consumption in general is shown and suggested to reduce risk for developing mild cognitive impairment associated with aging. So if you look at this graph with the y-axis being the odds ratio, you can see that just two servings of mushrooms a week can substantially reduce odds for mild cognitive impairment uh, by actually 60%. And so this re reinforces the notion that nutrients in our diet, such as those from mushrooms, like ergothionine, is important for increasing health span. And in this case, preventing the, the, the development of mild cognitive impairment. So then the next question may be, what are the dietary estimates of ergothionine? How does that correlate with human longevity? Because after all, ergothionine is considered a longevity vitamin. So is there data or any suggestions to show that it's actually correlated with human longevity? So here you see several countries plotted on a graph based on estimated ergothionine consumption based on the, the, the diet. So Americans are estimated to consume based on the diet much less ergothionine compared to people from certain European countries like Finland, France, Ireland, Italy. And so as a comparison, ergothionine, uh, Americans take in about one milligram of ergothionine a day, while Italians take in almost five milligrams of ergothionine a day. And so these graphs show an association between low ergothionine levels low ergothionine consumption, and higher mortality, higher mortality from neurological conditions, and lower life expectancy. So of course, associations do not imply causality, but again, this supports the notion that ergothionine may be important for longevity and healthy aging. Next question is, okay, that all sounds great, so what are the recommended use levels? Uh, so the use levels for ergothionine in food fortification is 5 milligrams per serving. And for dietary supplements, it's 5 to 10 milligrams per serving, up to 30 milligrams a day. And so 5 milligrams of ergothionine is approximate to one serving of mushrooms if you were to average out the, the mushroom concentration because it varies in the mushroom species. And so for food, it's five milligrams. For dietary supplements, it ranges between five to 30 milligrams. And the idea, again, is to increase a person's dietary exposure of ergothionine so they can uh, support, it could support healthy aging. So the last couple of minutes of this session, I'm going to introduce to you two ongoing clinical trials that Blue California is currently sponsoring. 
So the first clinical trial is looking at the effect of dietary supplementation of ergothionine daily for 16 weeks on healthy men and women between the ages of 55 to 79 years of age. And so this is the first clinical study, to our knowledge, uh, that looks at a causal effect of ergothionine in a healthy population. And so this really fills in the gap of our scientific understanding. So far, it's been association studies, there's animal studies, and so this is the first clinical trial looking at healthy patient populations to look at the effect of ergothionine. And so cognitive performance is our primary endpoint. The secondary endpoint includes mood, stress, and sleep, because in addition to cognitive health, consumers are interested in solutions that improve mental health stress, and sleep. And there is research to show that ergothionine may have potential to boost these, these effects too. And measurements are taken at four weeks and 16 weeks. So this study is conducted at Sea Cyro, Australia. If you don't know, that's, that's like the, the USA equivalent of the NIH in Australia. So prestigious health agency. And we're very eager to see results of the study coming uh, in, in the next couple of months. The second study that we're sponsoring is a pilot study looking at the effect of ergothionine, as well as one of our other branded ingredients, taxifolin, BCDHQ. Taxifolin is also known as dihydrocursetin on immune function. So in this study, healthy men and women ages 50 to 65 years of age were, to avoid to avoid, were told to avoid foods rich in ergothionine, and they were told to keep a food diary. So this is a pilot study, just because there's a little bit less research to look at immune function, but we are the first to invest in this. And we are keeping the background diet well controlled, completely deficient of ergothionine, and so they're taking a little bit more of ergothionine at 80 milligrams a day. And that's equivalent of consuming about five ounces of porcini mushrooms a day. So the regimen, uh, uh, the regimen was for eight weeks, followed by another eight weeks of a washout period in which uh, the, the patients are not taking any supplementation after eight weeks. And we're taking measurements at four weeks, eight weeks, and 16 weeks. So the primary endpoint is immune cell function, and the secondary endpoint is antioxidant status, we're doing some metabolomics, we're looking at fecal microbiome, and we're also looking at self-reported illness. So this study is being conducted at the University of Southampton in the UK under the nutritional department. And we're also very excited to see the results of this study in the upcoming months.